himself in by reading the scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Which might appear to love me. Yes, it does. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Before we get too excited, grab for your coats, catch up home. Uh, that's my theme, my text for this morning. Not the benediction, that is, now go in peace. Um, but may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Um, this is a very final verse in the final letter. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Church of Corinth, and at the very end of everything he says to them, everything he addresses to them, he says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This was not just a nice phrase to end his sermon with, but which was a passionate desire of this great apostle to uh, the Gentile churches. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I was a first generation Christian in my early twenties, totally ignorant of anything of a spiritual nature, uh, and people started using words and phrases, and uh, I was ignorant of them all. And they talk about the grace of Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus. Um, and I didn't understand it, but like somebody taught me an acrostic. I'm sure most of you will know this acrostic. You take the word grace and it's G R A C E, standing for. In case you didn't quite get that, God's riches at Christ. Expense, that's what the grace of God is. It's all the riches of God bestowed upon us at Christ's expense. What Jesus did on the cross, everything that Jesus provided through the cross, every promise of God provided for us at the expense of Christ, the price he paid when he died on the cross. And we can receive everything from God. You know why? Because Jesus paid the price. The old song I, I looked it up on YouTube, or tried to find it on YouTube, about I owed a debt. I could not pay. He paid the price. He did not owe. I need I needed someone to wash my sin away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Jesus paid the debt I could not pay. Okay, for your radio program this afternoon. <laughs> Rather new task. Last week I had my first of the song at the end. Uh, the current was trying to find that song on the radio show. I think she found it, but it was in tune on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how my folks from time to get home? Do you know how long ago they are? Yeah, okay. It could strip tape. <laughs> if I ever say anything derogatory about my singing ability, she does not like me doing that. Do you do? Pardon? Pardon? All oh, the riches of God are mine because of what Jesus did for us. Absolutely. That, and that's why we sing about the amazing grace of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. The love of God. Human mind cannot even begin to comprehend the size of God. We cannot define God. We cannot give a comprehensive account of what God is like. We, we really have no idea. Our little infinite mind can never really fathom the immensity of the infinite God. 
with the Holy Spirit. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. It's this subject of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit we want to give our attention to in the coming weeks and months. Fellowship, our relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. Last year, we spent time talking about the gift of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit and the outworkings of the Spirit. But now what we really want to do is just talk about the person of the Spirit and our fellowship with Him. The personality of God. The person. The person who is God. The Holy Spirit. So my task this morning is to introduce our coming weeks really, and uh, make some observations and then learn that brothers and sisters will be coming and unpacking and imparting the wisdom and insight and knowledge. And I'm just going to give some random thoughts this morning. Uh, I hope you uh, don't want to take too many notes because that might not be that easy. But it appears to me that uh, when it comes to the subject of the Holy Spirit, there are three categories of people. There are those who are uninformed. There are those who are misinformed. And there are those who are well informed. Every sermon should have three points, I was told. Uh, by somebody a long time ago, but then other people have said that was pointless. <laughs> Three types of people the uninformed, misinformed, and well informed. The uninformed are those who are very new to Christian things, or maybe even outside of Christian things altogether. Those people who have never been taught on the subject of the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they are the uninformed. And it's not a new thing, actually, even in churches, because even back in, in, in the New Testament times, it says, it says in Acts 19, 1, uh, that Paul traveled through to a place called Ephesus, where he found some believers. And when he found these believers, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they replied, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. And with great sadness, you go to church today, and they might even say the same thing today. There is what's the Holy Spirit. Great sadness, of course, is many people go to theological seminaries. Seminaries. <laughs> Christian life. 
It's only one thing. It's the things of God in me that I can do that. That's how God designed us to be. In the Old Testament, of course, people, uh, the Holy Spirit filled people, but the filling was a temporary thing. It was a filling for a particular task, a particular time. It was not the permanent indwelling of the Spirit that ensured salvation and empowered them to live life. But Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the Holy Spirit, David uh, Lyon spoke to us about that last week. If you've not heard that, see that. You can watch it on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. But David said to us, he quoted this verse out of John 14, 17. Uh, the Holy Spirit lives with you now and later will be in you. Right now he's with you. But he will be in you. See, the Holy Spirit was with them. He, he was operating uh, among them when Jesus was around. So God, Jesus commissioned them to go and do a particular job in the Spirit of God, but that commissioning enabled them to fulfill what God called them to do. But He was with them, not in them. Is that right? Do we agree? He was with them, but not in them. And they saw the Holy Spirit in, in full operation. As they looked at Jesus, the Spirit was indeed with you. know, there's no way you can go away from the Holy Spirit. Wherever you go, the Holy Spirit is there. The psalmist, Psalm 139 says, Wherever I go, you're going to be there. Wherever I go, wherever I journey, up the highest mountain, depth the deepest sea, wherever I travel, you're going to be there. You can't get away from the Holy Spirit. He's with you, but He might not be in you. If you're here this morning and you've not yet made that commitment to surrender your life to Jesus, uh, as Dave mentioned before, if you've never done that yet, it, you know the Holy Spirit might be with you. In fact, I believe the Holy Spirit is with you. In fact, the Holy Spirit is with you. You know the Holy Spirit is with you because He's wooing you and willing you and drawing you to Jesus. That's what the Spirit of God is doing. If you're in this room this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want you to know the Spirit of God is drawing you. That's why you're here today. He's drawing you to Himself. Does anybody remember when the Holy Spirit was winning and wooing you and you were resisting? I found the law. No, no, He got you down the alley. <laughs> when you come to the gate, chased you forever. Lovely Christian girl. You know, when she was not my wife. Before she, she's still a lovely Christian girl. But I would have felt that again. Before we were married, I met Pam, and she was constantly telling me about this person called Jesus. I love Pam, but I didn't want to know about this person called Jesus. And she was speaking to Jesus. And I went to that question, at this point where I said to her, Look, stop, I don't want to hear any more about Jesus. In fact, you've got to make a choice. Me or Jesus, who's it going to be? And he says, fine. <laughs> My God said, My God said. See, you are here today because the Holy Spirit is with you. He's been drawing you. He's been winning you. He's wooing you. He's revealing something of Jesus to you. You can't avoid it. You try to put him out in front of you. Wherever you go, you'll find it. Reminded that Jesus is drawing you by his spirit. You know, he was with them. But Jesus said he would be in them. And after his death on the cross, his resurrection, before his ascension, it tells us that Jesus appeared to his disciples in the in the upper room. John 20, 20. I think David mentioned this one again last week. Jesus said, So then, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed upon them. He breathed upon them. This word, breathed, 
empty seal that he did in Greek. Only appeared once in the whole of the New Testament. And I hate that. This word, dream, only appeared once in the New Testament. When he breathed upon them. In the Old Testament, which is originally, of course, written in Hebrew, but it was translated into Greek about 300 years BC, before Jesus is that. The Bible that Jesus would have said and used would have been the Greek New Testament. So in Greek, okay. I think that said at the time that Jesus quotes the Old Testament, he quotes Greek and not Hebrew. It was a common Bible at that time for the Greek speaking people. And uh, the only time that this word Greek is used in the Old Testament is in uh, Genesis 2, 70, where it says that God formed man from the dust of the ground, and, and, and God comes and he breathes into him, and he became a living being. See, the breath of God, though, in the Old Testament is the same as the impartation of the Spirit in this New Testament, so it, when Jesus came and breathed his breath, into his disciples. He had been with them. But I believe at this moment he is now in them. What a difference between having the Holy Spirit with you and having the Holy Spirit in you. You talk to some uh, lovely people sometimes who have come over to church for a while and have never made that commitment to Jesus. And what they'll say to them is, well, you know, I've always kind of believed in God and uh, always sort of tried to live that good life and uh, all those kind of things. Yes, indeed the Holy Spirit is with them. But the transition needs to take place so the Holy Spirit is in them. Amen? Here in John 20 when Jesus breathes his breath to his disciples in the other room, in the other room, a new creation order of human beings begins. A new creation order. But now there's a people again with the breath of life and the spirit of God in them. We have two prepositions here. One is the Holy Spirit is preposition in the breath. The whole one is the Holy Spirit was with them, but now the Holy Spirit is going to be in them. Different preposition. One is he's with them, he's going to be in them. But let me give you a third preposition because Jesus said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Third preposition. He was with them, he was in them, but they're going to come at home when the Holy Spirit will come upon them in power and you will receive power and it will cause you to become his witnesses. Telling people about Jesus everywhere. And that's what happened at Pentecost. A person of the Holy Spirit was poured out upon those gathered. Listen, it was the person of the Holy Spirit who was poured out upon those gathered. Jesus said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. They were not waiting for his power, but for the person who would empower them. Can you see the difference there? They were waiting for a person who would empower them. So often we have meetings where people want the power. And I want you to know it's no use reaching for the power. You have to be reaching for the person of the Holy Spirit. The person, not just his power, not just waiting for an experience. The Holy Spirit is not an experience, he's a person. But you will experience his power when you receive the person. They did not know how this person was going to turn up that way. And no idea how the Holy Spirit was going to come. He just said, wait in Jerusalem until you receive uh, power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. They had no idea how that was going to happen. We look at our Bibles and see it. In hindsight, understand it. They didn't know that. No idea. Maybe the eyes on that will go. Who knows? I don't know how he was going to come, but the person was going to come. And he was going to empower them. 
thing is the personal thing. I cannot have fellowship with power. I can only have fellowship with a person. Have you ever drive through any home electrics? Jim, not for the young for me, that's kind of tech man. I don't like touching electrics because my relationship with electrics isn't good. I can't have a relationship with that electricity coming out of the socket. Yeah. Hence the tap floor logic, if you don't believe me. Go on, put your feet on the tap and then put it in the socket. Give it a try, see how it works out. You can't have a relationship with the power, you only get a relationship with the person. And the Holy Spirit, the person of the Spirit, is coming upon them. The difficulty we have, you see, is that the Holy Spirit in the scriptures is it's difficult for us to picture the Holy Spirit. We've said this before, but he's not a picture of God. Because we know he's got a long white dress on and, uh, and gloves. We get a picture of what God looks like, but we get a picture of what Jesus might look like. But when we try to picture the Holy Spirit, the person of the Spirit, it's very difficult because he's always depicted as a dove falling, as a wind blowing, as a river flowing, as a, a fire burning, as a cloud moving. I mean, it's weird, really, to try to picture the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit doesn't give us a picture. What he will look like. Is that right? Not it. I know. But all of us. But he is a person, not, not just a dove of a river or a wind or a fire or a power. He is a person. He has all the attributes of being a person. He has a mind. 1 Corinthians 2 11 says, He knows. The thoughts of both God and man. 1 Corinthians 2 He knows because he has a mind. He has a will. In 1 Corinthians 12 11, he talks about how it's the Holy Spirit who distributes spiritual gifts in the church according to his will. He has a mind, he has a will, and he has emotions. Ephesians 4 30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. He's a person, not just a power. So, when you want to pray for somebody to be filled with the Spirit, here's the deal, folks. So we're not looking for a power when we're receiving a person. And it's in proportion to the receiving of the person that we will manifest the power. I believe being baptized in the Spirit is just relinquishing my life to the person of the Holy Spirit. Well, I can do in my life. Sing for the first of our song head to the side. Uh, and give it a little So far. Yeah. So at the end, anyway, we would not have given you everything you need. We all sing for this thing. I've said it so many times before, but Christians don't care about this. They just sing. <laughs> we sing these wonderful songs about relinquishing everything. But the rest of the world has to do that. And so, the night I was filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit came upon me for the first time. It was in March 1977. I went into somebody's house, and the Spirit of God was in this house, and people worshipping. And, uh, and I, I was totally against these things, but suddenly in a moment I realised 
smoker and you try to quit, you know how difficult that is. And I couldn't quit. I tried ever. Ever. You name it. You put away the words. You do not want to smoke. Yes, I do. <laughs> I could not quit. It controlled me. And I got in the car and reached out immediately for my cigarettes to have a cigarette on the drive home. And as I did that, I heard God speak to me and said, Who is Lord? And I said, You are Lord. He said, Well, this controls you. This controls you. Never had a cigarette since, never desired one, never wanted one. I was never just a medium dog. But the power of God, the power of God, not just so I could speak in tongues, but the power of God so I could live <coughs> my life submitted to His Lordship and nothing else was controlled in my life. I'm not beating you up if you smoke it, it doesn't matter if you're drunk, if you don't, stop it. It doesn't do any good. But the point I'm making here is that anything in your life that you cannot stop doing is controlling you and it needs to stop because God wants to be in control. The Spirit of God wants to be in control in your life. His power comes on you to give you power to live your life His way and not to be controlled by anything else. I don't know what it is in your life that you might think, oh, I've got this habit, I've got this thing. Can't stop. I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, you should stop. You know why? Because He is Lord. And that's why He comes. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power for what? Power to speak in tongues, power to power to live life. In freedom and in liberty. He is in us to empower us, to guide us, to instruct us. To strengthen us, he is the Holy Spirit. He comes to make us holy. He says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We want to be sure every person in this church is not part of the uninformed, but part of the well informed. Well informed about the purpose of the Spirit of God coming upon you. The uninformed, that was the uninformed, by the way, going on to the misinformed, and this is very quick if we're glad to hear. The missing form comes in all sorts of shapes and varieties. Um, from we don't even know if there is a Holy Spirit to uh, well, there is the Holy Spirit, but you know what? We're signs and miracles and wonders today in the gift of, for the title here, who calls the Satanist, that they don't believe the Holy Spirit is actively working today in healing and miracles. Signs and wonders, and we can go all along this line. I'm going to stop. Go ahead and tell you all along this line to the weird wackos that you see in meetings doing very peculiar things, taking it to a whole different extreme. We do not, in this church, advise you to start dancing around with poisonous snakes, but some churches do. Can I just suggest you don't do that? And there's all kinds of other weird and wacky things you've seen, and I don't want to talk about them, but you've seen them take place in Holy Ghost meetings, as they might be called, where people do the strangest, most weird stuff and call it by its spirit of God. No, it's not. Behave yourself. Stop it. The spirit of God might work occasionally tell you to do something, which might seem strange. My wife's looking at me with a hot That we need to say. <laughs> Some stuff you see in meetings is just weird. We don't want to be weird. <coughs> you know, the misinformed can be harder to make turn into the well informed than the uninformed. You follow that. 
hundred men, I said it. Um, can they be trenched in their thinking? Not open to open the scriptures and look at the stuff. Uh, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll leave that. Such a misinformed, but also the well informed and more well informed person, because I know it's me. But I believe that God wants us all to be well informed about the things of the Holy Spirit and the person of the Holy Spirit. The well informed. So that's what we're going to spend the next season, weeks, and months doing. Talking about the person of the Holy Spirit, how he functions, how he operates in your life. As I say, that year we talked about gifts and fruit, we're talking more around the person of the Spirit that influences us. If you want me to give you a, uh, give a, a denominational title to us as a church, I would. I like the title, Possibilitarian, by the way. That's, that, that's what I kind of like. I'm a Possibilitarian. I believe in Christ all things are possible. Uh, so I think he can do whatever he wants to do. But for us, I want all of our people to go deeper in their relationship with the Holy Spirit. We want all of our people to be flowing in the spiritual gifts, believing that they are still for today. We want all of our people to be walking in the truth of the scriptures. We want all of our people to adhere to the strict guidelines of scripture in how we can live our lives and how we can walk in our lives. We are one of the people who are passionate about accurate theology. Who theology sounds like a boys? Is that, I mean, that's, it sounds, it's, it's got a negative connotation to me somewhere, but I want you to know that to know more about God is fantastic. We want him to lead us into all truth, the Spirit of God. That's what he came for, by the way. He's come to lead you into truth and to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. We want the Holy Spirit to have freedom and liberty in all of our gatherings. That we can be ready to abandon our own or serve it for his agenda. A couple of weeks ago, I was scheduled to speak, and the sense of the presence of God was such in the room. I said, let's just forget that. Let's just continue this worship. We need to be able to be flexible enough to, be able to abandon our agenda and to allow God to do what he wants to do. Many people think, well, I don't mind God breaking into the meeting as long as I still get my bit to do. I don't want my bit to do, I want his bit to be done. We want to help him to help. We want him to help us in our praying. The Holy Spirit does that. He helps us. But we don't know what to pray for. Anybody find they don't know what to pray for? You think of a situation where you I have not got a clue what to pray for here. Or I have not got a clever word. I love some of the guys in this church, I don't think, who are good at praying. David Bain, great prayer. John Sutton Smith, great prayer. Malcolm Fisher. You know, these guys get up and they can eloquently verbalize what I've only got in a mumbled sentence out of my head. Does anybody else feel like that? Be yeah, what do you do? Hey, wow, I wish I could pray like that. But the Holy Spirit comes and, and even with groanings that cannot be uttered, signs he can understand and translate. He's fantastic at that, the Holy Spirit. We want to work. We want him to work through us to reach a lost world for Jesus. We want to be God's holy people because he is the Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy. I'm told if I sent an email, I should capitalize it because it's equal to shouting. Is that right? <coughs> capitalize it is like shouting. Uh, in the Bible, when, when, when God wants to emphasize something, uh, we couldn't capitalize Hebrew or Greek because they're not, not often in lower case. And so, so what happens in the Bible? 
God wants to emphasize something, as um, he repeats it, Jesus says, um, again, I say to you, truly, truly, I say to you, he repeats it. Lord of emphasize it. He repeated it. But then Isaiah 6, where Isaiah has a vision of the heavenly mountains and he sees God. And he goes, Holy, holy, holy. That's all to emphasize what God is doing. Holy, holy, holy. God wants a holy people. He wants you to be a holy one. Pure, spotless, and sinless. That's what he wants from us. That you might be holy as I am. Be the holy as he is holy. That's what God wants from all of us. That we might be holy like this. And the Holy Spirit comes in order to help us do that. We walk within our own strength. We will not do it like the white knuckle folks, hanging on, trying to do our best to get out of it. We'll do it by the Holy Spirit of God, empowering us, strengthening us, to enable us to live life properly. Amen. Well, Father, thank you for your encouragement <coughs> to us. And Lord, that we embark upon a period of looking at the person of the Holy Spirit. Thank God that you're first of all your anointing upon all the people who are going to come and show you. In their preparation, Lord, in the coming days and weeks and months, Lord, help them, I pray, to communicate into us that which you have us learn through them. Lord, we want to thank you for the power of God. Not only in us, but upon us. Pray, Lord God, that we might live today in a manner that brings pleasure to you, a manner which is approved of heaven. I pray, God, your kingdom does come, your will is done, your name is honored and glorified in Jesus' name. Well, thank you, Lord, for you poured into our lives, your grace. Let's just say that together, shall we? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.